of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue for our, with our next song, You May Be Seated. Continue with the readings. The Old Testament reading today comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, 
which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Fear the Lord, you his saints. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The epistle comes from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 17th verse. This I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth within his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits for the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The congregation will now stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, 
Truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated for our song of the month.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for your sermon this morning, the biblical basis for our thoughts together here today, are the, are the words of the Old Testament reading, which Mark read a few moments ago. The book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. So I want to begin today with something that I believe most of us have experienced, that uh, most of us have felt or dealt with at some point in our lives. Because I believe that all of us, somewhere down the road, have gotten fed up, annoyed, irritated with our jobs, our families, the news, and we've gotten to the point where we have said out loud either to someone else or to ourselves, enough, I've had enough of this, I'm done. I can tell you that I felt this way trying to pass linear circuit analysis in college. I didn't. I felt this way working at this radio station in Midland, which I've told you about before, uh, when I realized that all of my bosses were crooks, and I'm not exaggerating, that is not hyperbole. And you notice I'm not saying where are the call letters or anything, I don't want them to hear this and sue me if any of them are still alive. But the station owner and manager the program director and the sales director were all guilty of misappropriation of funds, payola, and so on. Okay. And meanwhile, I'm getting paid a whopping $9,000 a year, which was less than minimum wage because they gave me a salary to work 36 hours a week, but I was required to work 48. So, anyway. Another time where I felt like I've had enough, this is Erica and myself this time, we felt this way when Christopher turned two, and of course now he's 22, and we've forgiven him after 20 years, but we haven't forgotten. We were uh, looking at Christopher, and we had had enough when we realized he was two years old, and he was still only sleeping two hours at a time through the night. Eric and I looked at ourselves at that point, and we said, enough. And it was about another half a year. And he started sleeping through the night. But that was a long two and a half years, my friends. So in the text today, Elijah has had it. Yahweh, God, had given him what any prophet would call a good day. Possibly the greatest thing that happened to any of the prophets in the Old Testament. Now, this is not in the text. So I'm going to back you up a little bit. Actually, I guess it's this way. Back you up a little bit. Uh, to the verses before our text. Because what happened there is the children of Israel are worshiping Baal and Asherah. And if you don't know what it meant to worship Baal and Asherah, I won't go into details because we have some younger ears here this morning, but suffice it to say that worshiping Baal and Asherah was a fertility cult. And those worshiping Baal were doing a lot of fertilitying, if you know what I mean. Okay. So, uh, God was very upset that all of Israel had turned their backs on him and were worshiping Baal and Asherah. So he sent Elijah, and Elijah uh, uh, and God had this plan. They went to the prophets of Baal, there were 850 of them, and they said, we're going to decide once and for all who's God, Baal or Yahweh, which is God's name. And so they each built an altar, and the deal was, you pray to your God, Elijah said, I'll pray to my God, and the God that lights the, your, the altar on fire from above is God. You remember this in the Old Testament? So the prophets of Baal, they build their altar, and they start chanting, and they start praying, and after a few hours, nothing happens. So then they start beating themselves, they start whipping themselves, and and thinking that by uh, drawing their own blood, this will wake up Baal, and Baal will set the thing on fire. And nothing happens. And more hours pass. And Elijah is sitting there, and he's just kind of yawning and pretending not to try and fall asleep. And he starts trash-talking these guys. And I think this is the first instance in history where somebody trash-talks somebody. And he does it in very earthy language. So earthy that there is no English translation that takes the Hebrew that he said and translates it correctly in the English. Okay? And so finally, uh, Elijah says, enough. He tells those guys to quit because nothing's happening. 
And then he takes his altar and sets it up and puts the bull on the altar. And he dumps a bunch of water on it. Uh, that even has like a moat around the thing. And then he says, okay, God, light it up. And before he can finish the prayer, fire comes down from heaven and it eats the bull, the altar, and just makes this great big crater in the ground. <laughs> you know. And so now all the Israelites are going, huh. So they start chanting, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah's like, yes, we won, right? And he says, all right, let's take all these 850 prophets of Baal and execute them because if they left them alive, they would keep trying to get the people to worship Baal. And so uh, for that day, and going, when he went to bed that night, Elijah thought that he was king of the prophets. But then wicked Queen Jezebel said, not so fast, my friend. And I'm using that quote because college football is coming up, and if you know, you know. Not so fast, my friend. Not so fast, Elijah. By tomorrow, I'm going to see that you're as dead as my beloved prophets. So now we're in our text. And if you don't know your Old Testament, you may have noticed that you've never met anybody named Jezebel. Just like you've never met anybody named Adolf. Jezebel was quite possibly one of the worst people that has ever lived on this planet. She was an evil, evil person. And so she puts a hit out on Elijah, a contract, if you will, like we're talking a mafia film. And so the next day after Elijah is granted this great triumph by God, he runs away. He runs and he runs, and, and Elijah may have been the first ultramarathoner if you don't know what that is, you know, a marathon is 26.2 miles. There are some people that decided, you know, marathons are too short. And I'm looking at you now. And so they run 50 miles in a race or 80 miles in a race. I'm, 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 I'm looking uh, at our friend here who did the marathon in the spring. So some people run 120 miles road races. There's a race that goes through uh, Death Valley in California. That's like 100 miles. And if you're thinking, that sounds like a lot. You're right. It's kind of weird, but people do that. But Elijah may have been the first. So he ran out of his country, he ran through the neighboring country, and he ran out into the desert. And when he finally stopped and got his breath back, he prayed, enough! It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life. Elijah, Elijah basically says there, I've had enough. Now before we go on here, I do have to explain one Hebrew word for you, and I Guarantee you this is only one paragraph here. This won't take me long. But the critical word here for our purposes in this text is the simple word rav. It's three letters in Hebrew. And this short word is translated a lot of different ways in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's many. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's abundant. Sometimes it's numerous. Sometimes it's multitudes. And sometimes it's enough. And it's a rather abrupt beginning to Elijah's prayer. He does not, after this terrible thing happens to him that Jezebel's trying to kill him for just doing what God wants him to do, he doesn't begin that prayer to God by saying, O Lord our God, King of the universe. He does not begin by saying, you know, Dear Lord or Our Father who art in heaven. Instead, he begins his prayer, Enough! Which tells us that he would buy into our old English saying that we say, I've had it up to here. I've had enough. So Elijah in his prayer to God, after running and running and running away from naughty Jezebel, he tells the triune God, I've had enough. And we can understand why. I think we can all understand his disappointment and frustration. And look at it from the, the prophet's point of view, right? Because uh, he's endured years of deprivation, isolation, um, all kinds of stuff like that. Hiding, worry, hunger, knowing he's hunted. You know, Elijah did not live a cushy life. Okay? Now remember that Elijah and John the Baptist are considered, you know, the, the first one and the second one. And you know with John the Baptist that he wore really rough clothes. He ate locusts and wild honey. Ugh. Uh, he lived out in the desert. He did not have a comfy life. Neither did Elijah. Okay? 
So Elijah is never going to be featured in pastors and sneakers or preachers and sneakers. You ever heard of this? There's a guy on, on Instagram that a few years ago, he started putting up pictures of pastors at real big mega churches and just put up pictures of their clothes, especially their shoes. Because some of these pastors and some of these mega churches were standing in front of their congregants wearing $1,000 sneakers and stuff like that. And he just thought that, you know, a preacher shouldn't be wearing clothes that fancy. Now, if you're wondering, these shoes cost me $90. These pants cost me $39 at Kohl's. I'm not going to be featured anytime soon in Preachers and Sneakers, okay, just so you know. But anyway, Elijah did not have an easy life. And so at this point in his life, he says, enough. And this is how he begins his prayer to God. Now, there are times when people around us, as well as ourselves, will say things like, I've had enough, it's enough, I've had it up to here, that kind of thing. And it's very common to hear this idea of, I've had enough in our culture. For example, there are movies where characters go through stuff like this, right? Now, my favorite example is Peter Finch in the movie Network, which came out 1976, 1977. He had a very, very, very famous quote in this film that talks about what we're doing here. I can't give you the whole quote because it's got... But he said, I'm mad and I'm not going to take it anymore. All right, so maybe you recognize that. Much of the music we hear on the radio, smartphone, YouTube, expresses the theme, I've had enough. Whether it's lost love, loneliness, your dog running away, your pickup truck rusting, all these things show up in the list of our miseries, and yes, I'm making a country music joke. Uh, the, the old joke about country music, remember I used to work in country music stations, was if you play the traditional country music song backwards, your, your wife, your dog, and your truck all come back to you. Right? Now, I do need to point out to you that you know, country music did not invent this kind of song. In 1662, a hymnist by the name of Johann All wrote a hymn to honor a teacher in the city of Leipzig. And this teacher must have had a rough life because the hymn written for him is based on our text today where Elijah says, enough. And the name of the, the, the hymn was Es ist genug, which in English, and we have our German speaker back there, it is enough. Okay? I'm right, right? Okay, just want to make sure. Okay, so the verses list the reasons why the singer, the subject of this song, this teacher, wants to die, okay? So listen to the complaints. It's enough, Lord. Take my spirit. Uh, my griefs are gradually tearing me apart. The poison of sin has all but smothered me. Nothing good dwells in me. Uh, the, this cross you've given me almost breaks my back. How heavy, O oh God, how hard is this burden? Many nights I soak my hard bed with my tears. How long, how long must I yearn? When is it enough? This cheerful hymn is not in our hymnal. And I, and, and I don't know what this teacher was going through in 1662, but I hope none of our teachers who are preparing for this new school year are feeling this way, and I hope none of the students are either. But I suspect the idea here is familiar to you, because you too sometimes have felt that the burden was too heavy. Now this hymn from 1662, it ends with a little hope, but like Elijah, the author must wait for God's deliverance. Now, I can tell you, and this is for those of you who know the Lutheran hymnal, there is a happy ending to this hymn's story about this poor guy in Leipzig because Johann Sebastian Bach took this hymn, and I assume you've all heard of Johann Sebastian Bach, the finest Lutheran musician, musician ever. He took this hymn, he did his thing and rearranged it, and today we have the hymn, Esist Gnuk, which is the melody of our hymn, I Am Content, My Jesus Ever Lives. So Johann Sebastian Bach took this depressing hymn and turned it into an Easter hymn, a hymn that celebrates the gift of life that Jesus has won for us. Okay. And we sang it at first service today. But anyway, let's go back to Elijah. 
For Elijah, it was sad seeing him so unhappy and spent that he actually tells God, please kill me. But that didn't happen. Elijah was sustained by the angel of the Lord in the desert. God did some baking, and the results were miraculous. And remember, like I told you last week, God's a good cook. He knows what he's doing. So for all the companies out there making energy bars for people who run and bike and such, they would love to get God's recipe for whatever it is that he gave Elijah. Because Elijah wakes up, there's this little loaf of bread, and there's a glass of water there on a rock. He eats and drinks as the angel of God told him to do, and that angel may have been Jesus before Bethlehem. And then he goes back to sleep, he wakes up again, there's another thing of bread, another glass, and he eats these two things of bread, and he drinks that water, and he walks for 40 days and nights on that food. So like I said, you figure out that recipe, you can make some money, folks. But Elijah was given enough to go on with his life, although he still has to deal with his problems. You know, Jezebel is still trying to kill him. But Elijah was revived. He rebooted, if you will. He went back to work, but he did not see the final fulfillment of his hopes, not here anyway, not until the whirlwind took him to heaven. And if you know your Bible well, you might be thinking, Pastor, I thought a chariot of fire took him to heaven. Well, in that part of the Bible where Elijah and Elisha are walking along, it says they see a chariot of fire go across the sky, but it says that Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. So in the Old Testament, there are two people identified who uh, went to heaven without dying, Enoch and then Elijah. Now, I'm no Elijah, you're no Elijah, but I wonder if we know how we felt, because I think we do. To all those sitting around you, I'm thinking you too may have appear confident and put together and responsible, much like Elijah did. You know, I mentioned this two pages ago. But how do you see yourself after years stuck in the same job, after all the time striving to make ends meet with the long list of troubles that you could name, but you don't want to sound like a complainer? Well, the fulfillment of God's promise that Elijah longed to see was reserved for you. You may experience the same sense of despair. You may have the same long list of troubles. Because when we work hard and don't see the results of our work, we can, be dis- we can become discouraged, right? For instance, maybe you had a problem in school. When I was in college, uh, my first semester in college, I had to take calculus, and the professor gets up, and first of all, the professor's name was Professor Wanger, and this is exactly the way he talked, and he had a comb over that went from Milwaukee to Chicago here, and he had a big chalk stain here because he'd do, he'd do whatever, and then he'd wipe his hand here, and, then, and, this is the, and this is who I learned calculus from, okay? And the first day of class, he says, how many of you guys have had this in high school? And two-thirds of the people raise their hand. I'm not one of them. I'm like, I'm in trouble. And so then I go to my first TA group, you know, where they take all the people in the lecture and they go into small groups. And my leader of this group, his name was Daniel Lee. His name was not Daniel. That's just the name he adopted. He was from Taiwan, and he did not speak a word of English, not one word. And this is the guy who's supposed to teach me calculus. So I got a tutor. And so maybe you've had this experience. You decide to buckle down. You're going to work hard. You're going to put your nose to the grindstone, your shoulder to the wheel. And, of course, as I wrote this, I'm like, I wonder if the kids have heard these expressions. That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> All right. When I was growing up and my parents told me you need to work harder, they would say you need to put your nose to the grindstone and your shoulder to the wheel. All right. That was a phrase back in the day. Okay. So the problem then is how do we feel when we do all that work, we put in all that effort, and all we have is a broken nose, a sore shoulder, and a grade that has not changed. In my class, in my case, it was a C. I got a C. Now, the next semester, I had a different professor, and my TA was not Daniel Lee. I've never forgotten this guy's name. His name was Telemaco Tsasafratis. I got an A- in that class. I liked him better. But anyway, so maybe you had that problem when you were in school. And maybe there's something like this that has happened to you at work. Your sales are down. Your performance reviews aren't as good as they used to be. You decide to kick it up another notch, kick it into another gear. So you work longer hours. You do what the bosses say they want and then some. And how do you feel after you put in all that extra work and then your performance, your sales, and your reviews don't change? That can be discouraging. Or this can happen at church, too. We love the Lord, and like Elijah, we want God's kingdom and our congregation to grow. So we pray, we attend worship services, we volunteer to teach Sunday school or usher or whatever, we give of our income, we do all these things, 
and maybe the congregation doesn't grow the way we want it to grow. And that can be discouraging. But I'm here to remind you today that in those days that you are discouraged, in those days when you feel like, I've had enough, that you have received help from the same God who helped Elijah when he revealed himself as a man in the person of Jesus. Because Jesus never said, you know what, I've had it, that's enough. Until he had indeed done enough to pay for all of our sins, taking them to the cross. That was enough. The work of paying for our sins was finished when he said, it is finished. And his work of saving us was done when he died and rose again. And so like Elijah, Jesus has fed you with bread that sustains you. And not just ordinary bread and wine, but his own body and blood in with and under this bread and wine, which are the food of healing and life. Because Jesus said today in the gospel, I am the bread from heaven. And have you noticed that three of the last four weeks, this has been our Sunday theme. This has been our theme. And that the Lord's Supper is fantastic. It's amazing. Because this is something that brings us the strengthening of our faith. It brings us forgiveness. It brings us eternal life. Because remember, Jesus said, you eat of the eternal bread and you will live forever. Right here. And so now our complaints and our disasters and our problems are transformed into a song of resurrection victory, just like Johann Sebastian Bach took that depressing hymn and turned it into an Easter hymn. God has done the same turnaround with us. And we can stop saying, I've had enough. Instead, we can say, like that hymn I mentioned in the hymnal, we can say, I am content. There might be times that we tell God, I've had enough of this. But we know that Jesus comes to us. And he comes and gives us more than enough. Elijah, the great prophet, cried out in his hopelessness, enough. But now, because Jesus died and rose again for you and took away your sins, you and I, we can now say to God, it is enough. I am content. In the name of Jesus, amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Heavenly Father, please bless and receive these gifts which we give back to you from that which you have first given to us. Amen. The congregation will now please stand for the prayers and petitions of our congregation. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you sent your Son to be the bread of life, giving eternal life to all who come to him. By your Holy Spirit, lead the whole church on earth to imitate you and walk in your love as beloved children. Lord, in your mercy. Give strength and courage to all pastors and those who assist them, especially those suffering from conflict or burnout or depression. Hearten them by the example of Elijah and the prophets and apostles before them. Comfort them through the forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life. And we also pray for our friend, brother uh, Paul Hemingway, and for our friends over at Holy Trinity, that as he is installed today as their pastor, that he would be a blessing for them and they would be a blessing for him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, Hear our prayers for our nation. Cause us to live in harmony with one another and free our citizens from want, suffering, danger, and fear. Protect our troops, including Thomas, Matthew, Evan, and Chris, Maya, John, Ben, and Debbie, Seth, Christian, Jacob, and Jonathan, Nick, Preston, and Tyler. Lord, in your mercy. 
Show kindness to the sick, which would include those who are printed in our bullets and insert here this morning. And as usual, we take a moment now and pray silently in our hearts for those that we know to be in need of the healing and presence of Jesus. Never let them be in doubt that you hear their prayers. Relieve all pain and provide for those who suffer from any kind of hardship. Lord, in your mercy, bless those who commune today, that reconciled to each other in Jesus Christ's body and blood, we may rejoice to receive your forgiveness through this gift. Be strengthened in times of doubt and be nourished in body and soul. Lord, in your mercy, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you've had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and His kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. This feast of the Lord is prepared for you, the people of the Lord. Come to the feast.
stand for prayer.
we pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Remain standing for our closing song. All the people said amen. I'm going to say now, and all God's people said, Amen. I thank you very much for joining us here this morning and for uh, not rolling over when your alarm went off today uh, in the gloomy weather. God be with you and bless you this day and this week. Mm -hmm.